Um, so, yeah, uh, he had, I don't know how many scriptures, he had lots of scriptures. 
Um, then, but for the kids, it's, it's a much more subtle thing that you may not kind of pick up, at least at first, um, where the adults, it tends to be just more dramatic. Um, some people think it's a progression where you start off with this when they're, when they're young and moving forward. Um, this is possible. Um, I, I've also seen strictures and um, blockages in the young, too. So this can happen at any time. And then, so this can be flipped around as well. But this is the typical kind of progression of patients having these issues. Um, so the diagnosis here, um, peak eosinophils greater than 15 per hypophyllid or 60 eos per millimeter squared for European. Um, typical histological features, they'll see, they'll see basal zone hyperplasia and pan esophagitis. Um, so here is, Um, so in, in the upper uh, left corner, A, that's normal esophagus. B, uh, this is those red ones, that's our the acinophils here. Um, spread throughout. Um, C, where the arrow is, is uh, a, a, a superficial layer of uh, eosinophils, and then D is, there's a microabscess of the eosinophils. Uh, this is uh, the classic kind of findings when they look through endoscopy. Uh, with A being the normal, um, and then you see the furrowing, the white mucosal plaques, the tracheal ring, and then on the on E, that's for a, uh, a smaller caliber where they have this mucosa tearing because they put that through the scope. Um, it's really not a subtle disease, especially in more advanced stages. They usually just can look and identify whether or not to have it or not. So this is the current diagnosis criteria. Um, it requires not just the findings of ESN pills, but also the symptoms, all those symptoms that we talked about. And um, once that is confirmed, other causes of ESN pills and esophagus need to be ruled out. Um, and then currently, uh, a PPI trial is conducted, and then one must have, must have persistent ESN pills after high-dose PPIs to have confirmed DOE. At least that's the current um, thought process. Um, these are the various diseases that where you can have eosinophils in the esophagus um, that are not that is not EOE. Um, generally speaking, these are not these are um, easily recognizable for other reasons. So um, sometimes you'll see these people with the co-diagnosis of EOE plus plus X, but it's usually the other disease process causing eosinophils, and they'll be asymptomatic when it regards the, the, the EOE. Um, So this PPI trial um, that was started in, I think, 2011, uh, 2007 or 2011 recommendations has created this kind of artificial like split between two groups because there are a subset of patients who don't have GERD, who have the EOCP symptoms um, and they have the pathology, but they respond beautifully to PPIs. Like PPIs will make them better. And so um, in 2011, they kind of, um, designate them at, into two different categories, the PPI, the EOEs versus the PPI, eosinophilic esophagitis people, which they kind of just threw over to the side. They didn't really think they had true EOE. Um, new recommendations that were at this group called the GREE met in uh, 2017 and published in 2018, um, really think that this is an artificial distinction. Um, these folks have the same clinical, histopathological, even same similar gene expressions between these two groups. They have both are atopic. Um, the PPI REs um, respond equally well to standard EOE treatments like swallowed steroids, dietary exclusion, uh, just like the EOE patients. And so there's this push it hasn't been official yet for the to remove PPI as a diagnostic criteria and move it towards just treatment as a, and uh, not needing this as a kind of a bar to jump over. So right now, the best way to, and the only real way to diagnose EOE is by endoscopy and, and esophageal biopsy. Um, anybody who's gone through a medical procedure, you have to be sedated for this. This is not something you can be awake for. And um, this is not just one, um, because it's going to happen over and over and over again. My, my, my typical patients might go through three or four um, endoscopies a year, especially the ones that are heading towards the dietary exclusion types, where you're trying to, trying to establish this. So this is entirely burdensome. So alternatives, especially, are desperately needed. 
Um, this is one of the reasons that I don't really engage too terribly much with the EOE patients because I can't do any of this stuff, so I can't really guide treatment. And so it's a little bit of a frustrating disease for me. But if there was some other way that I could figure this out, it would be great. And so people have been working on this. They've been working on this for years. Um, and so far, nothing has, has come forward as a uh, kind of into the, into the mainstream, but there's a couple of pr proposals. Um, this is called the cytosponge um, or esophageal sponge. Um, it's in this gel capsule, that, um, that black one, they, and it's on a string, so they swallow it down, and it goes into their stomach with this string attached. And about five minutes later, the gelatin dissolves, and then this sponge pops open. And then they kind of rotor rooted the thing up, uh, all the way up, as they kind of go up the esophagus, they kind of scrape the inner lining, and able to kind of get very similar diagnostic uh, stuff, so they can do... Um, Measure the amount of EOE, uh, amount of eosinophils, as well as uh, other cofactors. Um, they've begun using this uh, for Barrett's, as well as esophageal cancer screening. Um, and they, and somebody did some work a couple of years back. Um, There's a lot of great work in like 2016. It's fascinating, and then nothing after that. So I'm waiting for this stuff. And so the preliminary work did distinguish normal versus EOE versus GERD, which is quite amazing. Um, there's a, I saw this video on YouTube of England, where this guy went through it, and I was imagining somebody gagging and spitting up. He seemed to be okay, um, like without too much of a difficulty. And uh, and so uh, they, they did it in kids too, and they seemed to tolerate it okay, and much better than endoscopy, that's for sure. Did so, they comment on mucosal tears there? I mean, if it's really uh, there, you could have this. No, it's relatively, <laughs> benign. it's relatively benign, so it's, it's not that aggressive in that term, so it's not punching through, and, and so. Um, no, they, they didn't, haven't seen anything like that. At least, well, at least not yet. At least they're not published. Um, there's also uh, a transnasal endoscopy. This is uh, uh, no sedation required, just local. And they, um, they found, they've done this in kids. Um, they can do biopsies through it. So this is something that the uh, gastroenterologist could potentially do, or uh, I think I, they even were talking about it. Ear, nose, and throat doctors who have a similar process with the, uh, the little laryngoscopy, just doing this as a little bit extra longer scope. And they were able to biopsy, uh, get able to, and it's very comparable to the standard uh, full sedation endoscopy. All right, so biomarkers. Can we detect this by blood? Um, so we, we, we suspect, and what most people conclude nowadays, is that this is a TH2 mediated disease. And yes, there are, they have elevated cytokines, um, TSLP, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, many, many other ones, but they really couldn't distinguish active EOE versus, um, versus inactive EOE versus other atopic conditions. It just has not been uh, precise enough to figure this out. So really all the work that's been done in blood has not really panned out at all. Um, and so really you need this if for, for uh, to monitor and diagnose, uh, mon diagnose as well as monitor throughout the period of time, and just hasn't been able to, to be done. Um, in 2016, there was an interesting paper that was published about uh, using 3-bromotyrosine, um, which is a kind of a byproduct of eosinophilic uh, activation. Um, they did find uh, an increase in patients with EOE compared to non-atopic controls, as well as um, um, EOE compared with atopic controls. Um, there was um, there was an interesting company that was doing this, and this was, again, stuff that was published in 2016. Nothing now. So I couldn't find anything more later later on. It would be a wonderful thing if somebody could pee in a cup and they could figure out if they had EOE or not. Um, nobody's looked at whether or not they could determine whether it has active or inactive um, EOE. Um, it was at least they could distinguish between active or uh, not, or EOE or not. And did they also look at it, though, a, a topic control, in other yeah. words? Yeah, so it's I mean, the problem, you know, I mean, phenos are increased in these patients, too. Sure. And almost anything you can think of that might be activated in asthma, et cetera, you know. It was 13 times higher in the atopic controls without EOE. So it still was not as not as crazy high with 93 times, but it was still higher. Did they also comment, though, atopics with asthma? Well, they just said atopic controls. I don't know about asthma because I would certainly worry about false positives. Oh, but I guess you wouldn't do it unless the patient had some symptoms. Yes. All right.
right, so the treatment for EOP. Um, so PPIs, that's now starting to become more, so just the, uh, just the uh, uh, diagnostic criteria is becoming one of the treatment options. Uh, some, of the, some of the GI docs I've worked with, um, they don't necessarily do PPIs first, they'll do other things first. Uh, topical steroids, dietary exclusion, elemental acid experiment, we'll probably talk about in turn. Um, swallow corticosteroids, um, over the last five, six years, there's been more than 10 controlled clinical trials in pediatrics and as well as adult patients using swallow topical steroids. This can be budesonide, reticosone, diclosinide, and it's very highly, highly effective. Um, what most, um, most of them do is they'll start them on high dose, uh, re, 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 uh, re-scope them in three months. If there's a response, then they'll drop them down to the more kind of maintenance daily amount. Um, this is not, this is, this is usually kind of mixed, especially the desktop, it's usually mixed in something else. The, they'll do like Splenda or, uh, I, I, one that was new for me was honey. Um, some of the kids really hate the Splenda because it's kind of clogged in the skin. I guess the honey is a little bit easier. And, just as viscous, it kind of helps kind of coat the esophagus as it goes down. Um, or using inhalers and just swallowing the tissue. So, or many different ways that they've done it. Uh, but this is effective, it's just not good long term. Um, so, better has to be done. Um, six food elimination diet. Um, this was published back in 2012, um, looking at peak eosinophils um, versus, and then starting the six food. This is gluten, milk, soy, egg, nuts, and seafood. So starting that out, and then as little as a month later, um, biopsying them and seeing this dramatic drop in uh, their yeast and fills as well as their symptom scores, and then reproduction food with a corresponding rise up, right? Um, so the biopsy, uh, as well as the uh, kind of like the figure of an individual of the EOD. So with left being the pre-diet, middle being the post-diet, and then reintroduction being Um, this six food elimination diet is very tough. It's not uh, really meant for uh, for life. It's it's a uh, it's non-compliance and poor compliance is it's very um, it's very common. Also, if you think about it, if you want to reintroduce each one of these groups, you're going to have to read biopsy every single time. That's a lot of endoscopies to go through each one. And so, what people have shifted towards is kind of figuring out now that we know more um, what is like the number one two in using those. And so what a lot of the GIs I've worked with have favored is like they'll put everybody on milk elimination. That takes care of a big chunk. And then they might add meat or egg or to that mix and then kind of go from there as they kind of expand going forward rather than doing this big, huge, like you can't eat anything to, um, all right, let's not do dairy and then check. And then if that takes care of it, great. Um, you know, again, but it still requires endoscopies uh, throughout the scenario. Um, elemental diets, um, also similar type of uh, response to the six food elimination, does really well. Uh, kids do particularly well with it. Um, and then you'll see this rebound once the reintroduction. This stuff is awful. If you've ever smelled or been around elemental um, formula, uh, I used to do this uh, uh, kind of tasting. Uh, I would do medicine and I would do formula tasting with my residents and interns. Um, nobody could palate this elemental stuff. It is disgusting, um, truly. And so, and it's wickedly expensive. So, uh, a grand a month to eat this liquid uh, slurry of peptides um, is what you're kind of committing to. Um, nobody knows this um, for very long. Okay, so uh, this is kind of like the, the flow process of like typical, what I've seen typically nowadays. For, for patients and, uh, and how GI manages these patients. So um, starting with either some sort of induction therapy, whether they choose food, um, topical corticosteroids, or elimination diet, something. And then we go back in two or three months, whichever one, whichever is their preference. Uh, oftentimes they'll kind of distinguish between adults versus kids. Usually the adults, they tend to favor the pharmacological therapies with the kids. Depending on where they train, they'll go. And then the responders, then they kind of will um, kind of enhance, they'll say this is your diet going forward, and they'll work with nutrition, or they'll drop down to lower dose kind of maintenance therapy with the PPIs or, or uh, the corticosteroids, and then just kind of monitor kind of yearly after that, uh, or pre-PRN. Uh, non-responders, and they kind of go 
down the kind of the algorithm, whether depending on what they did, to go to um, go down the diet route, do steroids, or do more PPIs. And then if that doesn't work, then it's um, comes to referral to a kind of more centralized center, and maybe you do get involved with other trials, which we'll talk about. So uh, a couple of proposed things. That, uh, Dan, excuse yeah. me, before you go on. Yeah. So IgE to the food protein is not an issue at, at that point. We'll, we'll, in other words, we'll, they we'll, were talk, we'll talk about our role at the yeah. Right. Yeah. and what we can do. All right. Um, but yeah, in their typical algorithm, there's allergy referral somewhere. <laughs> it's usually at the beginning. And we'll, we'll talk about what we can do and what we can do and whether it's, it's helpful or not. Um, so prostaglandin B2 receptor, or CRTH2, is a chemoattractant um, expressed by eosinophils and Th2 cells. Um, and this um, mediates chemotaxis attraction of eosinophils and the activator of lymphocytes. And there was this clinical trial that used, that did a randomized placebo-controlled trial, and they found that it significantly dropped eos uh, eosinophils in the esophagus compared to placebo. Had a mild reduction in symptoms and um, disease activity. It was very promising, at least. This was a first generation drug. Um, and nobody went into complete remission, but it was definitely kind of, uh, kind of pointing us in a direction that there, there might be some benefit here. Um, Anti IL 5, um, this has not worked at all. So, um, so you would think anti IL 5 might be beneficial in these patients. Um, at least the anti IL 5. Um, itself has not been. So there has been three controlled trials in children and adults. Uh, while blood and the tissue eosinophils improved, the clinical improvement was not significant. It was minimal. So they, they might have had reduction of the esophagus, of the, the, the eosinophils in their esophagus, but their but their the, everything kind of persisted, and they still had symptoms afterwards. Um, there is some thought that maybe anti-IL-5 receptor might be, uh, therapy might be a better option, but there's no current trials for, for EOE right now. There is one for eosinophilic uh, gastritis, on the other hand, which is, um, just to make it that distinct, EOE and the eosinophilic gastroenteritis are two completely different things. Um, the gastroenteritis are much more of a severe thing and needs like some sort of like immunosuppression um, and targeted therapy. Whereas EOE, um, most people don't pay for that or do anything in that, unless you're at the, the worst type. Um, so anti-IL-5 doesn't seem to be the case, uh, seem to be helpful. Um, Anti-IL-13 though, there seems to be some uh, signal through here. So there's been two different clinical trials with uh, two different types of anti-IL-13 and found both uh, moderate benefit with decreasing the symptoms and partial improvement of, of, of their symptoms, but no remission of their symptoms. But these were very, very short. These were maybe like a two months, three month uh, window. So it's, it takes some more time, but uh, it's definitely promising. Um, and there's right now a phase three uh, um, anti-IL-4 receptor clinical trial going on now specifically for the treatment of EOE that just kicked off and is still recruiting for this. Um, we're not doing, I don't know if anybody's even doing that for the COVID. Okay, so uh, getting back to Dr. Kennedy's uh, point, so what do we do in all this? Because, um, you know, we get these referrals for these patients from the gastroenterologist um, or uh, I pick it up myself. So um, you know, be, when, I'll talk about why in a moment, but I, I've been kind of like um, EOE whisperer where I, a patient comes in and I'm like, I think you might have EOE. And I've been right almost every single time. Um, so, you know, over CGI, and it's based on like their complaints. So I'll see these kids, um, well, they'll be vomiting, have terrible abdominal pain there. And it's, and it's a, it's a they, they're, they're a topic, but not necessarily food allergic. And, um, you know their their weight. That's the major that's a major uh, uh, kind of like vital sign for us, especially in, particularly in pediatrics. Like if a kid's not growing along his growth curve or flattening out, or uh, what I saw last week, dropped 15 pounds in a year, um, and was a, was a young lady, and that definitely shouldn't happen. And I highly suspect she has a baby. Um, it's it's something that we see more commonly. Like GI complaints for food allergy is is a very common complaint that I would get, whether or not they actually. But what they really want from us is uh, immediate allergy testing. Uh, and so try to d detect some sort of sensitivity or help some sort of guidance on exclusion or um, kind of removal 
Um, I, I haven't really found too terribly many um, kind of while the literature reports a high co co uh, um, co uh, sensitivity with food allergies. I have not found it personally to be the case. I find a whole lot of negative um, and relatively a few things that I uh, uh, detect that are positive that I think are clinically relevant. Um, sometimes with the uh, the arrow allergens and the oral allergy syndrome type things, I'll, I'll give recommendations on avoidance. So like the birch allergens or the, or the grass allergens and talking about like uh, the apples and the stone fruits and there's actually if they have any symptoms to kind of guide their uh, things. But one of the things that we can help with is guidance on reintroduction. And I'll talk about a paper in a moment that kind of changed my mind on how we can be helpful in this. Um, Hatch-free testing. Um, some centers do it, others don't. Um, some, uh, some folks in our group uh, were doing it several years ago because it trained, trained at a place that did it, um, um, at specifically at uh, Children's of Philadelphia. They don't do it anymore. Um, so I really find out, I've never done it myself, and a more recent paper that was just published earlier this year from Mayo, they did a, uh, a clinical trial where they did, um, only 50% had a positive um, APT, but only 60% of those had a, a patch test that related to the food. So it's just a terrible <laughs> test for it. So um, most have favored against doing any sort of patch testing for food uh, to help di direct this type of thing. So that means we're, that means that it's even more important for us to figure out a way to like detect EOD without having to uh, re biopsy somebody you know, 20 million times to figure out what food is their, their trigger. All right, so this, kind of, this paper that came out in July of this past year, it's a paper that I reviewed and kind of changed my mind on how uh, we approach, how I approach these patients. So this was a confirmed food allergy after uh, to previously tolerated food. So these are the patients who come in or got testing uh, from somebody and that were positive to a food and that was told, even though they were tolerating before, so they were eating and eating these foods fine before and then all of a sudden they get a test that's positive and somebody says, don't eat this. And then subsequently, um, developing an acute reaction. Some anaphylaxis, one patient died um, subsequent to this um, for, for exposure. And um, this paper very elegantly shows like, you know, what their avoidance period was, so as little as a month to, uh, to a year afterwards, and then why they eliminated it and who recommended the elimination, whether it was a dermatologist, an allergist, a pediatrician, alternative medicine doctor, and then um, subsequently, they brought these pa patients back in, did, did testing, and then did an OFC to the food um, itself and showed that they did indeed have a, a true IgE-mediated phenomenon. So this is much like uh, the, the cat allergic kid who has a cat at home who is completely fine with it at home, goes to college, comes back, and is miserable. So um, this is a similar phenomenon that, I'm, that we're seeing here that possibly with food. So, these kids uh, who are coming in for evaluation, um, I'm looking at it like, all right, I'm gonna do my skin prick testing. And if I see anything that's positive, like if that's part of the elimination, well, they're gonna get eliminated when they go see the GI. You can't introduce it until I see you back and I do it under controlled circumstances. So I'm looking at it in a slightly different way. So rather than figuring out um, like things to eliminate, I wanna make sure that it's safe when they do the introduction subsequently. And if you look on, on this side in this column, the type of food that they're doing, it's milk, 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 milk. And what's the first thing that they're gonna eliminate? Is milk, all right? So um, this pos site positive test could become significant um, once the introduction happens. And, this, and these are as little as a month to three months of eliminations where they had these true reactions. And so the typical elimination period is three months before the next scope, okay? All right, so 15 out of the 19 that was reported is all related to milk, okay? So, um, what about us causing EOE? So allergy treatment induced EOE. So SLIT, there's been several case reports in the literature from 2014 till now um, from grass, um, commercial product, as well as um, kind of the, the drops that, like, um, that some, some allergists or ET allergists will, will administer, or, or people have developed um, true cases of EOE subsequent to that, and then elimination of it results in EOE. Um, OIT related OIT has been reported, particularly in milk OIT. Um, and generally speaking, stopping it um, generally resolves the UE if it is related to the to the treatment that we give. So uh, more recently, um, Jonathan Swirgel and I published a paper looking at 
the eosinophilic esophagitis symptoms that are possibly related to uh, to the oral immunotherapy that they that they got. So um, we it was like this big meta analysis of every single published OIT uh, thing in together. Um, overall, about we found about 5.6 percent of the patients developed EO, confirmed EOE um, throughout the entire throughout the process, whereas um, about 30 percent or so uh, stopped it with EOE-like symptoms with the stomach pain, the vomiting, and everything, which kind of kind of helped, um, which kind of prevents them from continuing on in the oral immunotherapy, which is very similar to what uh, the AMU uh, kind of data that with the peanut OIT. About in similar numbers, about about this much, with not confirmed EOE, but definitely was suspected, with about 5.6 to 5.9 percent that stopped it because of that very reason. So with the with this um, introduction of all these kind of treatments, although I, I don't really do slit very often, I, I haven't found many in insurance companies to cover it, and I've had the worst experience with the, the commercial slits. So I, I've had anaphylactic reactions to it. Um, so I, I've been very hesitant to start uh, people on slit. Much more, much more side effects on slit than I've had with OIT. It's interesting. Yeah, um, just, yeah. Sorry, just a quick question from the prior slide. Yeah. Was there anything in retrospect that could have, like, were there risk factors in those 5.6%? Like, in retrospect, they had a history of episodic reflux or something that might have predisposed them. I'm just curious. I, yeah, I'm betting not. But there was. It wasn't that. It was. It was a really hard kind of analysis. How inconsistent the AEs were reported, and it was just yeah. that they reported AEs, sure. and so there was no kind of context. This was um, this was out of like uh, dozens and dozens of studies that were compiled. So obviously, if people aren't going to scope all these patients, but I've always wondered how many of these people have subclinical EOE to begin with. Most and definitely, we're just fanning, so fanning the flames with the therapy for, for sure. And so there's it's not been published yet, and they're still working on the data. Um, Kari down at Stanford is working on this um, the, this uh, research protocol. It's called Poise. So they did um, endoscopies before starting peanut OIT, and then um, and then periodic endoscopies during as well as kind of afterwards. And so they're blinded right now. But the patients that they biopsied, she she did uh, kind of uh, we talked about this. So the patients before this, so there's something about 30 percent had detectable like diagnostic. Or histopathological EOE before they even started. Um, so quite a few of them um, did have some sort of eosinophilic um, kind of things here. But it's but it's, it's that's super important is screening out these these patients before you get started with this. And so um, before embarking, especially since this is going to likely be an FDA approved product with OIT next year at some point, barring any sort of any I, I doubt anything is going to change this. Uh, we have to like be Um, this, these are very subtle. Uh, um, I had one patient who um, they, the parents knew about this problem, but they didn't think it was that big of a deal. Like sometimes food got stuck, like you can just drink more water, and it was kind of dismissed. Um, and it has rip roaring EOE. Um, they didn't know about that for two years, and they never reported it as an AE. They never reported it until some, they went to their pediatrician and said, "Hey, maybe you should go see GI." They didn't even tell us that he was going to go see GI, um, and he had. Biopsy confirmed uh, um, biopsy confirmed uh, um, EOE, and we had to stop OIT therapy. Now, interestingly enough, um, stopping the OIT had absolutely no impact on his uh, on his eosinophilia and, and symptoms. It, it <coughs> yeah, Tom. is there any preceding eosinophilia, peripheral eosinophilia? I mean, we see that with OIT, like peripheral eosinophilia. Yeah. Do we see that like higher eosinophilia in those that patients? That has been correlated. So that that specific has been correlated with GI symptoms. These guys have terrible atopic disease. So they okay. often have terrible skin. Terrible, they also have some asthma, rhinitis, and so they'll they'll have periodic eosinophil counts in the 700, 800, 900 range. Um, so it's 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 really messy. Yeah, you, you can't you can't use that as a biomarker to like figure out who's going to do what. Like predict right. as a predictor. Yeah, as a predictor well, yeah. No. It, no. Okay. The problem not. is the specificity is so bad. Yeah. By definition, given the patients. Because I, I, I we we are <laughs> measuring these as safety lab, safety labs in these. But they didn't like one. see like for instance abnormal levels like very high eosinophilia that preceding or in those patients who received like in particular those who developed EOE. 
did they have higher eosinophil than those who didn't develop EOE? That's a good question. I have a couple. Uh, I should look at that. Uh, I have a couple with the, all their kind of safety labs. I have a couple of the ones that we picked up. Nobody has described this, so um, I have the data. I can look at it. Great. Yeah, good idea. Um, so the so what we need to do uh, when when these patients start in OIT or SLID or whatever, um, especially the kids, tracking the growth curve, tracking that weight, making sure that they are they're growing and developing appropriately, right? So sometimes that will precede everything else. That flattening of the growth curve, that uh, dropping off their, their percentiles, super important. Um, reflux symptoms, um, this kind of clear spit up is, is interesting. Um, especially the young ones, they, they really don't understand what, what like heartburn means. And so you kind of have to like talk around it, like tummy feeling bubbly, that type of thing. So, um, which is, because we're going to be doing this in four, five, six-year-olds, especially uh, with some kind of OIT stuff because it's our patients. And then probing the questions of daily OIT. This is something that um, nobody's really published about, but it's something that um, we've kind of developed uh, to kind of pick this up, all right? Um, oftentimes, the, the kids who have um, the kind of the EOV or EOV-like symptoms, the question is, how long does it take you to continue your dose is important. Um, if they're gobbling up in 30 seconds, great. If they're taking the better part of an hour to choke this stuff down, well, there's some problem here. And so, um, like, I would just go in and say, are you taking your dose every day? I'm like, yes, I'm taking your dose every day. But not go into, like, all right, so is it awful? Like, are you having, like, the worst time in the world? Do you hate it? Do you like it? Uh, are you, like, oh, whatever? Uh, just a thing I do every day? And it, it was important. And, and if I'm looking back retrospectively, the patients who I think have, had EOE that, that stopped afterwards were the ones that really had problems doing it every day. They just, it was, it was causing them to have all these issues. Um, the other thing is that they just won't want to eat other things. Um, and it's this uh, kind of just this feeling of persistent nausea and just they lose interest in other foods and this kind of terrible abdominal pain that they get. And um, it's really been like uh, a much different than when I first started doing this in the trials to, to now much more actively kind of probing every single time that I, I see these patients. All right, uh, so EOE, the definitely increasing prevalence. We need a better non-invasive technique that can distinguish EOE from other conditions. Um, allergy is useful in potentially identifying triggers and then reintroduction of, of them safely for the patients who, uh, who have the sensitivities and that are getting eliminated. Um, with the new immunotherapies, supplemental oral, oral we've got to be vigilant to ensure we don't harm our patients as they develop these problems. It's, it's vitally important that we kind of monitor this stuff. And um, so I'll take questions. The reason it's short is that I have a procedure in like, at like exactly at eight. <laughs> so uh, it's short enough, but I can take some questions. The, uh, Mark Rosenberg had a variety of papers on microarrays looking at some yeah. fingerprinting. Is he was coming up with a few clusters of genes that like he was trying to and think might be useful for looking at responsive treatment. Has, has that just not panned out? Or? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really interesting how things have uh, kind of fizzled out in terms of like, the interest. I don't, I don't know if the money just kind of ran out and then nobody wants to kind of pursue it. I have no idea, but there's great stuff from a few years back, but nothing that's kind of canned since that point. Um, and it really, the only thing that's changed is the PPI thing, which is really not helpful yet for this chunk of patients. And, um, nobody's doing an anti-TSLP thing. I, I thought that would be an interesting um, approach to a patient that seems to be a big cluster of genes. And um, and definitely looks like the, the IL-4, IL-13 access pathway seems to be fruitful. At least we'll see what the Dupilumab does to these patients. Um, but yeah, nothing really um, in terms of active therapy. But even with that, it requires um, some sort of um, biopsy still at the end, so it still doesn't pass. And the um, EOE that's been induced in the OIT and yeah. the other trials, anything, did anyone comment on the longevity of it? Did it appear to be this same garden variety EOE that's induced, or is it hopefully a milder? Does it re well, the, re the, re the ones when they that are definitely induced, um, the symptoms dissipate as soon as you stop the, stop the those, those things go away. Um, and so um, what, we'll, what we'll usually do
do is, uh, if I suspect a patient has or is developing or is on that route, we'll just stop it and then see them monthly until, depending on where symptoms go. Symptoms are still there, send them over to GI and that'll get kind of the, di kind of get the diagnostic criteria. I got fooled once. Um, it was a, a kid that was losing weight on OIT without any problems and then I just noticed she was really skinny and losing weight. It was her, um, it was ADHD meds that were causing her to lose weight. And so I got her biopsy for uh, no reason. Um, but yeah, that's usually how, how it goes is that you stop it, see if it resolves, if it resolves, then you don't proceed with that, that stuff. So that's why I think maybe the rate of EOE induced, uh, like OIT induced EOE is probably going to be artificially low because we just don't proceed with that. So until we have some sort of alternative way like that I can really monitor it, I think that's when we can kind of uh, we can do that sponge on everybody or periodically or before and then if symptoms like you do it, then I think it'd be great. And then we can kind of really understand like what's, what's happening in these patients. Um, or if it's just bad reflux, because some of them will get reflux because of the, en the energy exposure. And uh, that's temporary, that, that will go away with desensitization. Um, yes, it's, it's a complicated story where because we just don't biopsy everything. Kari's, Kari's uh, uh, kind of like endoscopy paper in that study, um, it's about 120 patients going through all this. I think it will be in adults, I think it's adults, uh, will be very telling and kind of, uh, kind of clarify this, but it's, we don't have that information quite yet. Ah. Time to onset for this EOE and those oral, oral immunotherapy, is, it, is there any time, like time frame for these diseases, for the EOE to develop, or is it at any time? It can be at any time. So, um, it could be even a year, it could be during buildup phase, or it could be a year into maintenance that you develop these problems. So it could be at any point uh, that you'll see this kind of clinically. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why um, these long-term follow-ups, especially on maintenance, you have to keep your guard up. So um, all the kids that we've had with EOE um, have been on maintenance phase at some point, because it's not an acute thing. Um, so it's going to take some time for it, for it to be induced. Now, interesting enough, these EOE-like folks Usually, it's right off the bat. You'll see you'll see GI symptoms right off the bat, and that just will not go away, uh, with regardless of how you kind of approach this. There's all sorts of art to doing this, much like a skit where you kind of like play around with dosing, keeping them lower for a long period of time, then up dosing gradually, slowly changing the protocol. They just will not uh, get uh, will not be better. Okay. Uh, so I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so I'm like, oh, okay. Do you want to 
because I'm three years ago, like three days before my birthday, I had this surgery. Three days before, three days before. I mean, obviously, by that point, you know, I did more time. So then, from day on my birthday, we had to write some things. I was a bunch of that thing, which you can end up having, but I didn't find that thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm not one saying everyone's perfect. Right. 
Oh yeah, Tahoe. 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 Very good. Very good. Anything on you out for the letter? Right, yeah. The position there. Okay. Is it right. 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 I mean, I will send you the instructions. Okay, yes, yeah. I've just yeah. 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 relocated these from Washington, and now I'm back in there, actually. Yeah. 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 I will send you the contact, and yeah. 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 also the same thing. Yeah. 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 All yeah. Are the yeah. positions yeah. similar in yeah. kind of their split of time yeah. and what they're looking for? They're yeah. most of the time looking, so the staff are looking at 20 percent, the new clinic, 20 percent. Stanford, they go on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 Um, and Yale, they encourage research right. is quite right. the people so there are not the same person with the staff. Mm -hmm. so, uh, <coughs> so, uh, yeah. 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 If you look at position, a specific position of the paper, they count simply Set up for there? Right. So, I mean, for Yale, they want to have like all the packets uh -huh. available. And then for the for Stanford, they, they said in January, after they should count the this point in the And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the and the yeah. And the yeah. 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 I'm hopeful that the state will be able to do that. I know you have the MIT for the last few months. I just think I'll get to the last few months. That's great. So we'll start from the conditions to capture your property. Okay. Yeah, I'll work on that. Thanks. Thanks for your option. I'll just stop there. The GI guy just liked it a lot. That was another factor that, yeah, she did like to diagnose it, but <laughs> she preferred the law firm, at least the allergy component. Yeah. And uh, so it was actually the law firm. Yeah. Do you want to know the first sheet? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that was interesting. Yeah. So, there we go. First time for me today, I was trying to get here, and my garage door didn't open. Oh, no, really? So I left my Uber to the rescue. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. So luckily I contacted the scratcher, so hopefully we'll be able to come this morning to my wife. Yeah, who would think that would be the I pulled this off, but yeah. Yeah. It, it did happen. I was just like two minutes later. So yeah. It was amazing yeah. that this guy's thinking first, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got an opportunity. Just to conclude, I'm going to read both Wendy and I were working today on the kids. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to do from sending it. Oh, did you have to do it? Absolutely. But I'll be able to I'll get you some stuff.
Um, actually, I do. Oh, uh, you do? Oh, yeah. Did I get one and I'll send you an electronic version because there's a link in there that you can just And I've worked on it for a while. Yeah. But I'm from Eastern Washington, so I know Walla Walla really well. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. I go up to Prague, St. Mary. Oh, yeah. I know the pharmacists over there. So give them the next dose. I'll call them. No, no, no. The um, the one that had that kind of black anaphylactoid type response. Oh, yeah. I don't think that's ever been described in a, in a subset of urticaria. I think it's been described in the asthmatics, but not necessarily in the urticaria spectrum. Mm -hmm. So um, that would have been typical for sure. Because I thought it was weird to see that because they use it to treat anaphylaxis. Just to treat chromomastic. I 
just right. said I want to get close the computer. Yeah. <laughs> too much specifics with them if since we have you know, unless we've got a few cases to show, you know, to describe in detail, because otherwise I don't want to be held to the same, you know, we got somebody. 